they're not elected. They don't serve a limited term. They don't report to anybody. And at the very top of the corporatocracy, you really can't tell whether a person's working for a private corporation or the government because they're always moving back and forth. So, you know, you've got a guy who one moment is the president of, uh, of a big construction company like Halliburton, and, and, and the next moment he's vice president of the United States, or the president who was in the oil business. And, and this is true whether you've got Democrats or Republicans in the office. You have the moving back and forth through the revolving door. And in a way, um, our government is, is invisible a lot of the time, and its policies are carried out by our corporations on one level or another. And then again, the policies of the government are basically forged by the corporatocracy and then presented to the government, they become government policy. So it's an incredibly cozy relationship. This isn't a conspiracy theory type of thing. These people don't have to get together and, and plot to do things. They all basically work under one primary assumption, and that is that they must maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. This process of manipulation by the corporatocracy through the use of debt, bribery, and political overthrow is called globalization. Just as the Federal Reserve keeps the American public in a position of indentured servitude through perpetual debt, inflation, and interest, the World Bank and IMF serve this role on a global scale. The basic scam is simple. Put a country in debt either by its own indiscretion or through corrupting the leader of that country, then impose conditionalities or structural adjustment policies, often consisting of the following. Currency devaluation. When the value of a currency drops, so does everything valued in it. This makes indigenous resources available to predator countries at a fraction of their worth. Large funding cuts for social programs. These usually include education and healthcare compromising the well-being and integrity of the society, leaving the public vulnerable to exploitation. Privatization of state-owned enterprises. This means that socially important systems can be purchased and regulated by foreign corporations for profit. For example, in 1999, the World Bank insisted that the Bolivian government sell the public water system of its third largest city to a subsidy of the U.S. corporation Bechtel. As soon as this occurred, water bills for the already impoverished local residents skyrocketed. It wasn't until after a full-blown revolt by the people that the Bechtel contract was nullified. Then there is trade liberalization, or the opening up of the economy through removing any restrictions on foreign trade. This allows for a number of abusive economic manifestations such as transnational corporations bringing in their own mass-produced products, undercutting the indigenous production and ruining local economies. An example is Jamaica, which, after accepting loans and conditionalities from the World Bank, lost its largest cash crop markets due to competition with Western imports. Today, countless farmers are out of work, for they are unable to compete with the large corporations. Another variation is the creation of numerous, seemingly unnoticed, unregulated, inhumane sweatshop factories, which take advantage of the imposed economic hardship. Additionally, due to production deregulation, environmental destruction is perpetual, as a country's resources are often exploited by the indifferent corporations while outputting large amounts of deliberate pollution. The largest environmental lawsuit in the history of the world today is being brought on behalf of 30,000 Ecuadorian Amazonian people against Texaco, which is now owned by Chevron. So today it's against Chevron, but for activities conducted by Texaco. Estimated to be more than 18 times what the Exxon Valdez dumped into the coast of Alaska. In the case of Ecuador, it wasn't an accident. The oil companies did it intentionally. They knew they were doing it to save money out there rather than, rather than arranging for a proper disposal. Furthermore, a cursory glance at the performance record of the World Bank reveals that the institution, which publicly claims to help poor countries develop and alleviate poverty, has done nothing but increase poverty and the wealth gap, while corporate profits soar. In 1960, the income gap between the fifth of the world's people and the richest countries 
versus the fifth in the poorest countries was 30 to 1. By 1998, it was 74 to 1. While global GNP rose 40% between 1970 and 1985, those in poverty actually increased by 17%. While from 1985 to 2000, those living on less than $1 a day increased by 18%. Even the Joint Economic Committee of the US Congress admitted that there is a mere 40% success rate of all World Bank projects. In the late 1960s, the World Bank intervened in Ecuador with large loans. During the next 30 years, poverty grew from 50% to 70%. Under or unemployment grew from 15 to 70%. Public debt increased from 240 million to 16 billion, while the share of resources allocated to the poor went from 20% to 6%. In fact, by the year 2000, 50% of Ecuador's national budget had to be allocated for paying its debts. It is important to understand, the World Bank is, in fact, a U.S. bank, supporting U.S. interests. For the United States holds veto power over decisions, as it is the largest provider of capital. And where did it get this money? You guessed it. It made it out of thin air through the fractional reserve banking system. Of the world's top 100 economies, as based on annual GDP, 51 are corporations, and 47 of that 51 are US based. Walmart, General Motors, and Exxon are more economically powerful than Saudi Arabia, Poland, Norway, South Africa, Finland, Indonesia, and many others. And, as protective trade barriers are broken down, currencies tossed together and manipulated in floating markets, and state economies overturned in favor of open competition and global capitalism, the empire expands. You get up on your little 21-inch screen and howl about America and democracy. There is no America. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide and Exxon. Those are the nations of the world today. What do you think the Russians talk about in their councils of state? Karl Marx? They get out their linear programming charts statistical decision theories, min and max solutions, and compute the price cost probabilities of their transactions and investments, just like we do. We no longer live in a world of nations and ideologies, Mr. Beale. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. is being taken over by a handful of business powers who dominate the natural resources we need to live while controlling the money we need to obtain these resources. The end result will be world monopoly, based not on human life, but financial and corporate power. And as the inequality grows, naturally more and more people are becoming desperate. So the establishment was forced to come up with a new way to deal with anyone who challenges the system. So they gave birth to the terrorist. The term terrorist is an empty distinction, designed for any person or group who chooses to challenge the establishment. This isn't to be confused with the fictional Al-Qaeda, which was actually the name of a computer database for the US-supported Mujahideen in the 1980s. 